Good morning. Here's a question for you. What are you afraid of? Just sit with that for a few seconds. What are you afraid of? For me, I don't like spiders. They sort of freak me out. Why? I don't know. I must be a thousand times larger than any spider. I presume that I could just smash it out of existence. Still, I'm wary of them. They just give me the heebie-jeebies. Now, that's not to say that I'm fond of snakes. (laughs) But I don't see that many snakes. It's curious, isn't it, what frightens us? Often our fears make little sense at all. I'm guessing that you know someone who is afraid to fly, afraid to get on an airplane. Now that that person has an irrational fear of flying. I say irrational because statistics prove that you're safer on a commercial airline than you are driving your car. And the same person I know who is afraid of flying gets on I-45 regularly headed to Houston. Go figure. I'm guessing you might know someone who is afraid of elevators. I've got a friend who is afraid of elevators. And so he won't stay in a hotel room on any level above the third floor. I discovered that a few years back when we were both at a conference registering at the reception the same time. And when he got his room assignment, he said to the receptionist, oh, I had called in. I'm I'm supposed to be on the third floor or lower. She said, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Let let me see. I'll, I'll fix that. Well, I assumed he was afraid of heights. So as we were walking... away from the desk, I said, Don, don't you know that jumping out of a window on the third floor can kill you? I said, you need to limit that to the second floor. That's as high as you should go. He said, oh, no, 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 no. It's not height that even bothers me. I'm just afraid of elevators. I said, oh, well, that makes sense. (laughs) She said, I'm afraid of elevators, so I want to say, on the lowest level possible because I have a bad knee. He says, you know, it's walking up the stairs, which is the problem, not the height. Makes sense. You see how fear can affect our lives, limiting us? We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Am I right? But these are crazy days. These are crazy days. And it seems that no one is safe anywhere any longer. You go with your family to a 4th of July parade in an Americana Midwestern town. And suddenly, suddenly bullets begin raining down on you. And a shooter is aiming his powerful rifle straight down on the crowd. Shooting, killing, old and young alike. Where can you feel safe anymore? One grieving resident tearfully told a reporter, if a a tragedy like this, mindless shooting can happen here, it can happen anywhere. This town is like Mayberry, she said. And then she added to the reporter, at least it was. Who is safe anywhere these days? It seems as though our country has gone crazy. Terrible, horrible, unimaginable horrors become almost commonplace. How many weeks away are we from Uvalde? Not that long, huh? 19 children were looking forward to a summer filled with soccer 
and swimming and sleepovers. Two teachers were closing out the school year, which had started with such promise and joy. But they're all dead now, killed by an 18-year-old gunman from their own community, a little South Texas ranch town. Where can you feel safe any longer? We live in a time marked by fear. Fear of what might happen. Fear of what is happening. People are jumpy. One reason is because we live in a connected world. That has its upside. It has its downside. We're bombarded with information hooked on a 24-7 news cycle. And everyone and everywhere is vying for our attention. And it's receiving our attention through our likes and our clicks and the time that we give because we are tracked. (laughs) And guess what attracts the most attention? Stories which play on our fears. You see, nowadays, our news isn't called just from our neighborhood or from our community. No, not just from our local neighborhood community, but from every neighborhood and every community. And so there is always something happening somewhere to make us afraid. How many of you have your televisions on continuously? with CNN or Fox or CNBC running in the background, you know what fear is. How many of you have canceled travel plans when COVID-19 came and you've yet to reschedule them? You know what fear is. How many of you have been watching carefully, daily, at the downward spiral of the stock market since January, watching as your retirement investments just wither away, you know what fear is. How many of you have grandkids or kids who are about to make the first solo backpacking trip to Europe? And they're excited, but you're worried. You know what fear is. Now, it's wise to fear some things, of course. We should all be wary of high-voltage electricity. We should should watch out for snakes. And people say, well, most of them are fine. There's just a few. I just don't know quickly which one is which. A healthy dose of fear is good it can protect us and as parents we understand that and that's why we tell our children say don't touch the stove it's hot it will burn you that's why we say don't run into the street you can get hit by a car that's why we say never get into a car with a stranger believe me it is a good Good thing. It's a healthy thing to have certain dose of fear, certain kind of fear in our lives. But we should not live in a constant state of fear. It is not healthy. And it is not who we are called to be. What are you afraid of? I've been asking people that question the past few weeks, knowing that I'd be... I'm assigned these topics, you understand. (laughs) You're on January 10th. Here's your topic. (laughs) So I've been asking people, what are you afraid of? The most common response is, I'm afraid of heights. But when you scratch beneath the surface, what else are you afraid of? You get a different kinds of answers. A different level. One friend on the golf course, I asked him, just asked the foursome the question, the threesome plus me. I said, What are you afraid of? I got different answers. 
I probe. A friend said, well, I guess if I were to be honest, the answer is, I am afraid of failing. Failing. That's what worries me, he said, and I've not yet been able to shake it. This morning, we're starting a five-week sermon series entitled, God is Always With Me. Do you believe that? That God is always with you. Well, that is what Scripture teaches. Where can I go from your spirit, the psalmist asks. Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. The antidote for fear is the promise of God's presence, knowing that God is with me. Over and over again, the message of Scripture is, fear not. When Abram was called from Ur, and when he took his family to this promised land that God would show him, he was afraid, leaving the known for the unknown. That's always frightening, isn't it? What did God say to him? Fear not, Abram. I am your shield, and your reward will be great. I am your shield. When the Hebrews, when the Hebrews stood at the Dead Sea, and they could see Pharaoh's chariots coming over the horizon, they were terrified, believing that they would all be slaughtered. And Moses said to them, stand still, fear not, and see the salvation of the Lord. When the angel of the Lord came to Mary, announcing that she would give birth to a child, and his name would be called Jesus, the Bible says she was terrified. She trembled with fear. She did not understand any of this. And what did God's messenger say to her? Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with the Lord. Let me say again, the antidote for fear is the promise of God's presence, knowing that God is with me. Now there's a story in scripture which speaks to this very issue. It's about the time when Jesus calmed the storm. The storm. That event made such an impression on the disciples that when they were writing down later their memories of their time with Jesus, their experiences with Jesus, Matthew and Mark and Luke all included this story. You remember? Jesus was exhausted. I'm sure they all were. Day in and day out ministering to the masses who just followed him everywhere. Finally, needing some time to get away for rest and renewal and replenishment, he said to his disciples, let's sail to the other side. The other side of what? The other side of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. Let's get away for a few days. And scripture pointedly notes it was night when they set sail. Jesus was in the stern of the vessel, asleep. His head was on a cushion. Suddenly, a storm struck. Not just any storm, a severe storm. And the disciples, wide-eyed with fear, woke him and say, Lord, don't you care? Look what's happening. Can't you see that we're about to sink? <laughs> the disciples, afraid? You bet they were. In fact, the Bible says they were terrified. Interesting, isn't it? Here we have 
a boat filled with fishermen, career fishermen, and they cry out to Jesus. Jesus wasn't a fisherman. <laughs> no. He didn't grow up on the water. They did. He was a carpenter, not a boatman. His experience was with hammers and nails, not with rudders, not with sails. No. Why should anyone expect Jesus, that Jesus could help at a time like this? But the disciples thought that he could because they knew. They knew he had uncanny power. They couldn't explain it. They didn't fully understand it, but they had seen it. They had experienced it. These passengers in the boat knew that Jesus had power like no one else they had ever encountered. Time and time again, they had seen him at work, restoring sight to a blind man cleansing a leper of his scaly skin and restoring him to the community from which he had been cast out. Oh, healing a paralytic so that he could walk again. They'd seen him bring sanity to a deranged man. Of course they cried out to Jesus. But Jesus was soundly asleep. Jesus, how can you be sleeping? Don't you know the situation? We're about to drown. Don't you care? People throughout the ages, even into our own day and age, have had the same response when caught in a storm. A young mother dies leaving a grieving husband and two small children, and people wonder if the Lord was sleeping through it all. A loved one dies from COVID-19, and the family wonders if perhaps God had been taking a nap. A home is broken, a painful separation and divorce, and those who were hurt wonder if the Lord cares at all. Isn't that at the heart of fear? The worry that God is not really on our side? Or that God will put us out on a limb and just leave us there? Or that in the midst of the storm, God won't be there for us? That, we'll be left, that we will be left on our own? Oh, dear friends, when these moments come, when we feel anxious and alone, that's when we need most to remember Jesus' promise. What did he say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let the calm, strong assurance of this precious promise settle down in your soul knowing God is always with me. Therefore, I will not fear. Therefore, I need not fear. We can take comfort trusting that God has never gone AWOL with us. As the psalmist wrote, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber, will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Well, that's the key to overcoming fear. A growing confidence that God is with us and that God is able to meet our needs. That's the assurance which God gave the children of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. You see, friends, there 
there is an antidote for our fears, a truth that can calm our minds and can, can bring quiet to our hearts. It is the promise of God's presence. It is the truth that come what may, God is with you. Whatever the world deals out, God is with you. That kind of confidence is called faith. In the middle of that stormy sea, Jesus shouted, quiet, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And after that night, I doubt if the disciples ever feared a storm on the Sea of Galilee again, if Jesus was with them. They knew he was able and that he cared. Now, sometimes that lesson is difficult to learn and to absorb, isn't it? And I dare say that it is a lesson that we actually have to relearn from time to time. It's hard for us to shake our fears. It's hard, isn't it? And that's, that's true even for those individuals who have deep faith. It was hard for the Apostle Paul. Imagine, it was hard for the Apostle Paul. Even he had to wrestle with this, with this issue. Listen to his own words. He wrote in 2 Corinthians, when we came into Macedonia, we faced conflict from every direction with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. Paul faced fears just as you and I do. Fear of inadequacy. Fear of failing fear of those who would do us ill. Let's be honest. Fear is not easily overcome. But the longer we live with Jesus, the more confident we become that no matter what troubles afflict us, no matter what kind of storm we face, it is not too much for Jesus. The Apostle Paul came to understand this truth. Listen to what he wrote. He was able to write later, if God is for us, who can be against us? Paul continues, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? His conclusion, nothing. Not death, not the past, not what might come, not height, <laughs> not depths, Nothing, nothing in all of creation will ever separate us from the love of God extended to us through Jesus Christ. So friends, the key to managing our fears is faith. It's faith. Faith that God, that God has us, that God, he's got us in the palm of his hand. And that no matter what this world throws our way, God will not let go. So we can say confidently, as within the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Let the calm, strong assurance of this precious promise settle down into your soul. God is always with me. Therefore, I will not fear. Of course, I mention again, fear is not always a bad thing. There's a kind of fear that's a God-given fear. Fear can be helpful, alerting us to danger, reminding us that we are fragile. But certainly, fear should not rule our lives. Certainly, fear should not incapacitate us and keep us from moving forward and advancing because, let's acknowledge, life is risky. Life is risky. Bad things do happen. Accidents do occur. 
Sometimes the phone call is terrible news. Sometimes the nightmare does come true. But God says that we need not be afraid because nothing can separate us from his great love, that he is with us always. And one day things will be different. That's the overriding message of scripture, that someday things will be different if we trust in him. One day there will be no more mourning, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more accidents, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. (laughs) But until then, we surrender our fears to God and allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen us for whatever lies ahead. Regardless, regardless of what happens in life, remember, God will be with us. The psalmist said, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. He is our rock and our salvation. Where else are you going to go? If the stock market drops 5,000 points when the bell rings on Monday, God is still going to be the same. God is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. If we get in a war with Iran or Russia tomorrow or next month, God is still the same. If I get a bad medical report, God is still on the throne. God does not change and nor do his promises. In life, there are storms, but God is with us. That is our great salvation and hope. I love that verse from Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. You know it? Why? He answers it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear for thou art with me. The Bible's consistent message is that our security is found in God, in God's protection, in God's strength, in God's reliability, in God's love. I'm going to close with this story. It's about a bishop of the Methodist church from some many years back named Bishop Warren Candler after whom the School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, was named Candler School of Theology. It's one of our official seminaries. Old Bishop Candler was on his deathbed, and a friend, a pastor, was there with him, and he asked him, he said, Bishop Candler, do you feel frightened? Are you afraid? Do you Fear crossing the river of death. The old bishop, Warren Candler, just lay there for a few moments. And then he whispered, not at all. Why should I be afraid? I belong to a father who owns land on both sides of the river. And so do we, my friends, so do we. Fear not, for God is with you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.